want to get the views now of one of the world's most influential economists, Nouriel Rabini, joins me live from Italy, where he's attending the uh, biannual Ambrosetti Forum. Mr. Rabini, thank you so much for speaking to us. So we were hearing there are announcements coming out of Ireland Thursday, another 24 billion euros uh, to plug the hole, the capital shortfall in their banks. Will this mark the end of this crisis, or are they going to need more money? Uh, we don't know whether they're going to need more money, but in my view, taking hold of the losses of the banking system and putting them on the balance sheet of the government doesn't make sense. The public debt has already gone last year from 70 to 100 percent of GDP. At this pace, it's going to be 120 percent of GDP. Eventually, the back of the government will be broken. The right solution for the Irish bank will be to take this debt, the senior secured and unsecured debt, of the banks, reduce it, convert it into equity, so you recapitalize the banks that way, and you're not adding further losses to the balance sheet of the government. Otherwise, you're going to have not only a banking crisis, but also a sovereign debt crisis. That would be the right approach to take, rather than massively socializing these private losses. That doesn't make sense. So what, is, what will that mean if the government, it does look like the government could be increasing its debt burden, taking on that level of debt? you know, in, in addition to what they've already taken on so far. Tell me about what the sovereign debt crisis scenario will involve. Well, the banking risk becomes a sovereign risk when governments bail out financial institutions, but eventually that leads to the risk of a sovereign debt crisis, and that can damage the real economy and the financial system. So you have then from sovereign risk back to banking risk. The stock of public debt is already very high, above 100 percent of GDP. It would be rising sharply because of still large budget deficits and additional losses of the banks that are being socialized and put on the balance sheet of the government could eventually lead to a sovereign debt crisis in Ireland, like it's going to lead to a sovereign debt crisis in the case of Greece that has already lost market access. So you have at some point recognized that these are not liquidity problems of governments or banks. These are solvency issues, and whenever there are solvency issues, orderly, market-oriented, but coercive restructurings of public and private financial debt is necessary to avoid this insolvency. What about Portugal? That country seems to be on the brink of a bailout. What would that mean for the risk of contagion in Europe? Well, Greece lost market access, then Ireland now is uh, Portugal. I think the big question is not Portugal, that is uh, too small, but rather whether the contagion could over time spread also to Spain, a country that is on one side too big to fail, but maybe also too big to be saved. The fundamentals of Spain in some dimensions are better than the rest of the periphery, but in other ones, uh, you know, large unemployment rate, a housing bust, uh, the financial losses for the financial system, the loss of competitiveness, those fundamental problems of uh, Spain are also serious. So it's an open question of whether it will be eventually contagion and loss of market access for other countries, starting with Spain. Yeah, so how difficult do you think it's going to be then for Spain to isolate itself from contagion? Well, Spain has to take tough economic decisions like accelerating structural reforms, like uh, having fiscal austerity, like in the case of Portugal, it's a minority government. In Portugal, that minority government lost essentially its ability of passing that tough uh, reform austerity legislation. There is an open question whether there's going to be an acceleration of those economic reforms that are necessary for Spain not to lose market access. And certainly the political risk is one of the dimensions of uncertainty about what's going to be happening. There have been reforms that go in the right direction, but much more radical reforms need to be done to stabilize the economic, financial and the fiscal conditions of Spain. So still a risky, well, still a fragile situation from what you describe. How risky then is an ECB rate hike and what will the results of its tightening be in the Eurozone economy? Well, I understand the logic of the ECB decision. They're going to likely start raising rates in April and continue for a few times this year. 
because the core of the eurozone is growing fast and headline inflation is above target. But you have five countries in the periphery where there is almost no growth or contraction, where you have severe banking problem, where you have had a loss of competitiveness, where there is a need to restore economic growth. And I fear that the early hike is going to increase the growth fragility, the worsening of competitiveness with a stronger euro, the financial fragility both of the banking system and of the government. So on net, uh, that's, a, that's a risk. Are you concerned about a policy split between the U.S. and Europe and the financial instability that could potentially bring about? Uh, certainly, U.S. and Europe are on different tracks. Uh, on monetary policy, hiking by the ECB, for now the Fed on hold. On fiscal policy, more stimulus in the United States and instead fiscal austerity in the Eurozone and the UK. So on many economic macro policy issues, there is certainly a divergence between what Europe is doing and what the US is doing. That's a source of uncertainty for the markets and that divergence can also lead to movement in interest rates and exchange rates that could be at some point dangerous and destabilizing. You're mentioning the U.S. We're getting non-farm payrolls out later this Friday. What do you think it's going to tell us about the labor market picture in that country? Well, the U.S. labor market might be improving, but if we're going to create, on average, for the next few months, only 150,000 jobs per month, that's just enough to maintain the same unemployment rate because labor supply increases by 150K per month. For the unemployment to be reduced significantly, we have to start creating 250,000 jobs per month, something, in my view, is not likely. So the labor market remains weak. The housing market is double dipping. The structural budget deficit of the United States remains uh, unresolved. And those are, among others, some of the downside risks to U.S. economic growth, in addition to the sharp rise now in oil prices that is a negative for growth and increases inflation, not just the U.S., but also in all the other advanced economies and emerging markets that are net energy importers. Just very, very briefly, uh, you're speaking about the U.S. housing market, the U.S. labor market. Uh, you've said before these are two big risks uh, to global recovery, to U.S. economic growth. Are these risks getting worse? Is the situation getting worse? Are they bigger risks now than they were, say, at the start of the year? Well, uh, the labor market in the U.S. may be gradually improving, but uh, the housing is already uh, double dipping, certainly, both in terms of quantities and prices. And the U.S. fiscal situation remains unresolved. The U.S. has decided to kick the can down the road. There is even a risk of a government uh, shutdown. And therefore, there are a number of now global risk and uncertainty from the United States, from the periphery of the Eurozone, from rising food and oil prices, from the turmoil in the Middle East, uh, from the situation in Japan. So we are still having plenty of risk and volatility from the macro, financial, fiscal, policy, political, geopolitical, and regulatory. And those are going to be things that are increase uncertainty and may make investors, consumers, and businesses slightly less confident about their recovery. Nuriel Rubini, thank you so much.